If you're new to the Wheel of Time, having just seen the season finale to the TV show's second season, or if you're a veteran of the books, one of the most important MacGuffins in the story is the Horn of Valir. Central to both the story of season two of the Wheel of Time and to both the early and later parts of the book series, the Horn of Valir has a serious plot purpose, but what actually is it? How does it work? Where does it come from? Today, we're going to break down everything about the Horn of Valir from the books and talk a little bit about how it was shown to be used in the TV show as well. So join me today as we discuss the Horn of Valir. So before we get too deep into the lore, take a moment and like the video if you enjoy Wheel of Time lore content and pay extra attention right here for a spoiler warning for the current content I'm talking about throughout the video. I'll be updating it all the way through. But let's dive right in to the lore of the Horn of Valir. It is a golden horn. All right, all right, yes, yes, it's a golden horn, but what is it really? We really can start with its appearance. It's a golden horn, roughly described as resembling like a French horn. The TV show version has a much different appearance from the way it's described in the books, but in both cases, it's a golden horn that can be blown. The horn also has an inscription in the old tongue that translates to, the grave is no bar to my call, which I think is a great lead in to what it does. When it's blown, the Horn of Valir calls back the dead heroes of the horn, including wolves, to fight for the person blowing the horn. That part we all know. But how does it do that? Where did the horn come from? What rules govern its use? So the Horn of Valir is a very old item. It's older than the Age of Legends, having been a curiosity even back during the advanced society of the Aes Sedai and the Age of Legends. In fact, it's those very Aes Sedai that inscribed the writing on the horn. So if it predates the Age of Legends, who made it? What was the purpose in making it? It's unknown when the horn was created, but we do know that if the first age is our age and we don't have any myths about the horn, then it's possible that it was created between our time and the beginning of the second age. In terms of what the horn is, it's likely some form of a Tirangrial. While this is never confirmed in the notes or in the story that I'm aware of, many Tirangrial can be used by those who can't channel. Given that the heroes of the horn reside in the world of dreams, the horn seems to bridge the gap between Teleron Riyadh and the waking world, allowing the heroes to exist in the flesh while also remaining mostly invulnerable. We could speculate that the horn works similar to Sheogul in the sense that the space between the world of dreams and the real world appears thinner there as well. There's like a time dilation effect around Sheogul, and in the show at least, we see everything slow down around the heroes of the horn, and they're able to move at basically super human speeds. This would make the horn an incredibly powerful Terangrial, but again, how was it created before the Age of Legends then? Or does it even predate our time and we just didn't know about the horn in the first age? One thing that we do know, and this comes from Robert Jordan's blog entries while he was writing Knife of Dreams, is that the horn was created by mortals. It was not made by the creator or the Dark One. Despite the Horn of Valir having some crazy and powerful properties, there are some rules governing its use. For one, once the horn is blown, it is tied to the person that blew the horn until their death. That link is shattered upon the horn blower's death, but until that time, anybody else that were to blow the horn would not call the heroes back when they blew the horn. Now, a misconception, even to the characters within the book, is that whoever blows the horn also controls the heroes of the horn, even if that is the shadow that blew the horn. Now, this is corrected in A Memory of Light when Arthur Hawkwing confirms that the heroes of the horn would refuse to fight for the shadow. They appear to have a free will of sorts and despite being committed to the cause of defeating the Shadow. The heroes are in the World of Dreams, as we mentioned, and they can be interacted with if they are seen there, but they are forbidden to do so under certain prescripts of their residence in the World of Dreams. Now, the origin and exact regulations of these prescripts are never really explored, but they are not supposed to help or make themselves known until they are called by the Horn, something that Birgitta just says, that. Despite all of the power, though, that the heroes of the horn have, they are not invincible when they are called. They can be incapacitated, they can be bound, and they can be injured, but if those that are fighting them know how to do so. Now, we don't know how exactly they could be injured, but we are told by our Hawkwing that they could be. They are immortal, they can't be killed entirely, but they are not completely invulnerable when called to fight. Another item of interest is that it is possible to become 
a hero of the horn. Now it's unclear how it's decided that someone becomes a new hero, but those who in life demonstrated great courage or valor, they can be added to the roster by the wheel. They are essentially the greatest heroes of the pattern, and when a new great hero emerges, they are added to the list of other great heroes to be called back by the horn. But yeah, about those heroes. Well, actually, before we talk about the heroes of the horn, let's talk about something else that's pretty cool. There are a lot of you that are watching these videos that have read the books before, but there are also a ton of you that have just seen the TV show and want to learn more about things about the TV show, but without having to dive into a gigantic book series that you may or may not have had time to read. I get it. It's a lot, but I have a suggestion and it ties in with the sponsor of the video. My suggestion is to check out the audiobook versions of The Wheel of Time. They are narrated so well, they're enjoyable to listen to, and you can easily read the books while traveling in your car, riding on the subway, cooking dinner, working out, or even getting ready in the morning. The books are amazing. They're entirely worth a read, especially if you enjoyed the TV series. And the great part is, is that because you're one of my listeners, audible.com is going to give you a free audiobook of your choice. Now, Audible is the world's largest depository of audiobooks, and you have two great options for the first Wheel of Time book, Eye of the World. There is a version by Kate Redding and Michael Kramer that fans have loved for years. Then there are the new versions being narrated by Rosamund Pike, the actress portraying Moraine in the TV show. Both versions are great, and all you have to do to get your free version is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless and sign up for the trial. You can keep the book even if you choose not to keep the series. You never even have to pay a dime, but you'll have a good grasp on whether or not you like the audiobook format or not. Audiobooks are the main way that I reread the series now, and I encourage all of you to give it a shot. Check the links in the description of the video to find out more about that, but it's audibletrial.com forward slash nameless. But let's get back to those heroes of the horn. So... Who exactly gets summoned when someone blows the horn? It is revealed in the story that there are near a hundred heroes of the horn during the story. While there are a lot of them, including wolves, we only have a few that are named and that we know about. Robert Jordan appears to have drawn from myths around the world when selecting the heroes to put in the story, as they all reflect potential mythological figures from our own time. So, who are the heroes of the horn that we know about? Well, first and foremost, we have Arthur Hawkwing. Arthur Hawkwing is one of the strongest Tavirin of all time. He's a conqueror, he's a ruler of nations. I have an entire video devoted to the fascinating life and achievements of Arthur Hawkwing, if you're interested. It's actually really cool. He has a great story that would make a great TV series in of itself. Check out that video by clicking up here or find it later. Arthur Hawkwing appears to lead the Heroes of the Horn, at least in a sense, being their battle commander, although that's not explicitly stated. He wields a sword known as Justice, and he tends to speak for the heroes when they get a shot. Next, we have Amerisu. Now, Amerisu wields the Sword of the Sun in the story. She is likely an analog log to the Japanese sun goddess Amaterasu. Robert Jordan said during a book signing that Amerisu is a female version of the dragon in the ages that require a female savior. So that's kind of cool. Next we have Birgitta Silverbow. Now Birgitta plays a huge part in the story. She's an archer who wields a silver bow and arrow. She's said to never miss. In all of the lives that she lives, she is spun out as an archer, but she specifically mentions two of her lives as Marion, probably related to Maid Marion from Robin Hood, and Joel Joanna, likely related to Joan of Arc. We know the most about Birgitta of any of the heroes because we get her as a one of the main characters for so long during the story. We also know that she has been spun out 12 times since the breaking of the world and that she was alive during the Age of Legends and during the breaking itself and had an intimate knowledge and encounters with the Forsaken, specifically Mogidium. She is almost always associated with Guido Kane, who is another hero. Speaking of Guido Kane, he is described as a dark and strongly muscled man that is somewhat ugly and harsh and carries two swords on his back. As mentioned, he is almost always tied as a love interest of Brigitte Silverbow, and they are always born together or most of the time at least, and they play roles in each other's lives. Uno appears to have taken the place of Guido Kane, or at least Uno was Guido Kane reborn in the TV show. Kind of interesting. Next is Blaze of Matuchin. Blaze is a golden-haired woman, and the name ties back to an Arthurian legend. Not much else is known there. Buad of Albane is another hero of the horn. She is described as being as regal as any queen. This is likely tied to an Irish island in the name of an Irish clan. Kalane the Chu 
Souser is described as being a red masked rider that is often seen with her brother Shivan, who is also a hero of the horn. She is a parallel to the goddess Kali from the Hindu religion. Now, Shivan the hunter is the brother to Kalian and is also known as the herald of the end of the ages. Shivan rides with a black mask on his face and he is related to the destruction of what was and the birth of what is to come. Now, Shivan the hunter is a parallel to the Hindu god Shiva. Hend the striker is a man wielding a hammer and a spike. He rides a gigantic horse and is a parallel to John Henry from American mythology. Another hero is Michael of the Pure Heart. Now, not much is known about him in the story, but he's probably a parallel to St. Michael. We have Jane Charon, also known as Jane Farstrider. This is a character that we met in the story and we didn't find out was a hero of the horn until the very end. I also have a video on Jane Farstrider and his life. If you want to learn more about who he is and what made him famous and all the stuff he did, it's actually also really cool. Next up is Otarin, who is also known as Oscar. This may be a reference to the legendary Irish fighter in mythology. Another hero is named Pedrig. Pedrig is the golden-tongued peacemaker, and this is very likely a reference to St. Patrick. And lastly, we have Rogash Eagle Eye. He is named Rogash of Talmur, who was famed at the court of Ardor Hawkwing. He was a hunter, and he was probably known as the greatest of the hunters. So that's Rogash Eagle Eye. So that's the list of the heroes of the horn that we know about. But it also may be interesting to discuss who isn't on that list that most people think is. Now, I'll start with one who actually might be a hero of the horn. We just don't have confirmation on it. And that is the dragon. The heroes know who the dragon is. They refer to him as one of their own, in a way at least. Also, knowing that Amaris is the female world savior and she is one of the heroes of the horn implies that the dragon might also be but what about matt and perrin well matt is the horn sounder and he is referred to as the gambler by the heroes of the horn they have a title for him but does that mean that he's a hero of the horn it might seem that way but the answer is no this was explicitly answered by hend the striker in a memory of light who says that matt may have earned a place but he has not yet been chosen perrin is also not known by any of the other heroes of the horn and is not specifically called by name and they always remember the previous incarnations of each other and refer to each other as such so it's very likely that perrin is is not a hero of the horn. Now, somebody I will throw out there that maybe has earned her way would be Egwene. I would certainly hope that she would get a shot at that. That would be pretty cool. So we know the Horn of Valyr was created before the Age of Legends, but was it studied? It's not really clear. We we know that it was never used during the War of Power that ended the Age of Legends, which is odd if they knew what it did. But we do know the Aes Sedai did have it. After the Bloor was sealed and the men were going mad, the Horn was given to Someshta, the Green Man, along with the Dragon Banner, and was taken to the Eye of the World where it stayed until the beginning of the story. It was guarded at the Eye by the Green Man and was at the bottom of a pool of Sidene. Sometime during the time while was buried there, Ilion just decided randomly that they were going to host hunts for the Horn of Lear. So apparently people knew about it enough after the breaking of the world to keep searching for it. And again, Ilion, sometime around a thousand years before the start of the story, just decided that they were going to start hosting a great hunt for the Horn. It's not clear that there was any connection there, but so be it. But it was found after Moraine, Lan, Rand, Egwene, Nynaeve, Matt, and Loyal reached the Eye of the World and defeated the two Forsaken. The Horn, along with the Dragon Banner and a broken seal in the Dark One's prison, were taken back to Faldara, where they were protected by Lord Agomar. Juan Sanche, the Amarlin seat, arrived in Faldara and was about to take possession of the horn when it was stolen by Dark Friends, specifically Padon Fane and a bunch of Murdral. He was chased by Rand, Matt, Perrin, Loyal, and a party of Shinarans led by Ingtar Shanoa. Eventually, Rand was able to recover the horn briefly when he was separated from the group with the help of Selene, also known as Lanfear, but the horn was retaken by Fane, who took the ways and arrived in Falm. He gave the horn as a gift to High Lord Turok. The horn was eventually retaken by Rand and his group and was blown by Matt Cawthon as they were surrounded by a White Cloak army as well as a Sanchan army. The heroes fought and defeated the Sanchan under the dragon banner as Rand fought the Shamael in the sky. The horn was taken back to the White Tower. It was hidden away by Varen and Swan until it was needed again at the last battle. During the last battle, Fayol was tasked with transporting it to the battlefield or getting it to Matt because at this point they think it's connected to Matt. But her caravan was waylaid. She was lost in the blight. Ulver, who had been with her, was running for his life from Trollocs, ended up blowing the horn. 
and summoned the Heroes of the Horn at just the right time. Although Matt had blown it first, Ulver was able to blow it as Matt had previously died and been reborn due to Balefire, something that he was not aware of. The Heroes helped defeat the Shadow, and it was unknown what happened to the Horn after the story, other than Birgitta instructed Ulver to take the Horn and hide it somewhere that no one could find it, potentially just throw it in the ocean. So, what are your thoughts about the Horn of Valir? Is there anything I missed? Let me know in the comments of the video. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to get more Wheel of Time lore and TV show content. Huge thank you to my patrons. You make this channel possible. You make all of this content possible. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you would like to become a patron, click the link in the description of the video and check it out. Lastly, if you liked this video, you will very likely like one of these right here. Thank you for watching and until next time, peace out.